So my name is Mike Waldridge. I am a professor of artificial intelligence at the University of Oxford and director of AI at the Alan Turing Institute uh, in London. I'm an AI researcher. I've been an AI researcher for more than 30 years. Uh, and the reason that I'm here today is I'm this year's Royal Institution Christmas Lecturer, which will be on artificial intelligence. Um, the question, what is artificial intelligence, is just a phenomenally difficult one. Nobody owns artificial intelligence. It's a very broad church. Lots of people have very different ideas about what it is and what it should be. For some people, artificial intelligence is the Hollywood dream. What they're after is the idea of building machines which are as fully capable or perhaps even better, uh, more capable than, than human beings. Machines that could do everything that a human being could do. Uh, and that's sometimes called general artificial intelligence. Um, for other people, and I'm more in that other camp, Artificial intelligence is about building tools, building uh, uh, computers that can do very specific tasks better than human beings can. So, for example, uh, machines that can uh, d diagnose abnormalities on a heart scan or spot tumours on an x-ray, those kinds of things. Um, and uh, the bulk of work in artificial intelligence is around those kinds of problems. Um, but I say it's a broad church. Nobody owns it. I certainly don't own it. You know, everybody listening to this will have their own views. But I have to say the centre of gravity in AI is around extending the capability of machines to get machines to do things which currently only human beings can do. I hate the word revolution uh, to describe these things, but I think what we've seen is genuine breakthroughs in the sense of a step change in capability of AI in the last few years. And it happened around about 2020 prior to ChatGPT. ChatGPT is the one that everybody noticed. But around about 2020, there were AI systems released which were markedly better than the systems that went before them. Uh, and that really got the attention of AI researchers. And we realized, OK, this is a different game now. We're, we're in a different league here in terms of the capability. And so genuinely, I think somewhere around about 2020, we moved into a new era. Things have definitely changed. Uh, and everybody in my community is busy exploring what these new technologies can do, what these new AI systems can do, uh, trying to understand them, which in itself is no, no trivial thing. They are phenomenally complicated things to try to understand why, why they do what they can do and how they do what they can do. But yeah, I think we are, this is one of those moments like the emergence of the World Wide Web that is going to be a watershed moment in scientific history. We are at the point now where general purpose AI technologies are, are reaching a mass market, and that's a new thing. We haven't been there before, and it's happening very, very quickly. So when the World Wide Web first appeared, it took sort of five or six years for it to really reach uh, a mass audience before people, people on the Clapham Omnibus were, uh, were using it. And we've seen much more rapid take up of these general purpose AI tools just in the, just in the last year. And so things are changing much more quickly than, than we've been used to in technology over, uh, over the last few decades. We've seen lots of technological changes, you know, the, the arrival of smartphones around about 2010, and then going back to the World Wide Web uh, before that, and then before that, the desktop computer and so on. But they all took a, a, you know, years to unfold, and we're seeing this unfold in the period of, of months, if not weeks. So it's just going to be embedded in absolutely everything. And to some extent, it already is. But we're going to see a lot more rollout of that technology into your word processor and your web browser. And so within a year, I predict, pretty confidently predict at this point, you know, you'll be able to just select a paragraph in, in your Word document. And there'll be an option to summarize it or to turn it into beautiful English or to turn it into English that would be understandable for a 10 year old audience or for a, a professional business audience and so on. And people won't even realise that that's AI, but it absolutely it is AI. This generation is going to think of ways of using this that we can't even begin to imagine. They're going to think up very clever, ingenious, and for us old fogies, weird ways of using this technologies. They're going to create new businesses and services, again, that we can't even guess at right now. 
Um, they're going to find applications for it in their work life. It's going to make them more productive. It's going to take away a lot of the drudgery, I think, of, uh, for an awful lot of jobs and free them up to do the things that require human intelligence and human insight. Uh, uh, and emotional insight and so on. It's going to free them up in their in their jobs to do that. They're going to find use, ways of using it in leisure. It's going to appear in computer games and endless different applications. So it's going to enrich their world in an enormous number of ways. But for every uh, potential uh, beneficial use of this technology, there are there are ways in which it can be abused and misused. And it's just so important that people understand what those are and go into using the technology with their eyes open. And I think one of the most important ones was the issue of data and the being the unwitting provider of data about yourself. So everywhere where people deal with content, with understanding content, processing it, you know, people whose jobs are to take due documents and to summarise them, collate them into a single document, you know, just in London, there are probably hundreds of thousands of people whose jobs more or less involve doing just that. Um, uh, people whose job is to summarise or extract the key points from text. People who create uh, routine copy uh, pieces of text. People who create routine pieces of artwork. All of those in the very near future are going to be affected by this technology. If your job largely involves following a script and the only thing that you're really required to do is to understand what another human being is saying, but otherwise you're just following a script, then those kinds of jobs it seems to me are very vulnerable. And uh, in the UK, one area of immediate concern is around call centres. And there are hundreds of thousands of people in the UK employed in call centres. Um, and there is potential, it hasn't happened yet, but there is potential for AI technology to automate a lot of those processes. It is absolutely changing science. Every, all the experimental sciences are busy looking to see what they can do with AI technologies. And uh, if you're an experimental science, you produce data and, and things like the Square Kilometre Array, Telescope, uh, all of those like CERN produce vast, vast, vast quantities of data. And AI now gives you another tool to be able to analyze that data, to spot patterns in it, uh, to, to maybe form hypotheses about what's going on in the data. Now, I have to tell you, there are scientists out there who think this is more or less the end of civilization. You know, the idea that it's no longer human beings that are forming the hypotheses, but that a machine is forming a hypothesis. Or maybe even the machine uh, isn't even doing that. It's just telling you that if you eat uh, if you eat these red toadstools, then you'll die. But it can't tell you why or form a theory about why you would die. And for some people, th don't think that that kind of extreme inductivism, as it's sometimes called, is is even science. But uh, everybody is frantically looking to see what they can do with this. So it really is changing science across the board. So suppose you are an astronomer and what you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out how many spiral versus bar galaxies there are out there. So what do you do? You can take pictures of the sky uh, and expose them for a long time and you'll get pictures of lots and lots of galaxies. And you know, 20 years ago, you would go through those pictures and you would count the number of spiral versus bar galaxies. So with how does AI help you with that? Well, with AI, what you can do is you simply, rather than writing a program to identify a spiral or a bar galaxy, what you do is you simply show the program and you say, that's a spiral galaxy, that's a bar galaxy, that's a bar galaxy, off you go. And the program figures out how to do that identification on its own. And that's what the technology of neural networks and the like, the machine learning technologies, that's what they're extremely good at. And that's just one example, one very simple example of how the technologies might be used in modern science. But you can think of exactly the same kinds of scenarios everywhere you look in science, in biology, in chemistry, and so on. I'm absolutely fired up and interested in this subject. And one of the reasons is because stuff that seemed like it was just unimaginably distant at the start of my career, we now have. You know, we have tools that you can just converse with in ordinary language. They didn't exist even a decade ago. Nothing like the tools that we have now existed even a decade ago. And stuff that was just pure speculation and philosophy 10 years ago, now we can just, we actually can try out 
uh, and, and, and it's transforming AI into a kind of new science. Uh, in, in, that's, we're reinventing uh, AI as a field to be able to explore what large language models can do, what they can't do. You know, do, do they really understand people? Do they really understand at all? And these used to be philosophical questions, and now they're practical ones. We can actually roll up our sleeves and try things out. And that's just enormously, enormously exciting.